Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our KIPAC public lecture tonight. Uh, for those of you who are new, to welcome. KIPAC is the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology here at Stanford. My name is Dan Wilkins, and it is my great pleasure to be hosting this event tonight alongside our Outreach and Engagement Manager, Zinan Du. <laughs> Well, it's wonderful to see so many of you here, both in person in the room, and welcome to our online participants joining us on YouTube as well. We're delighted tonight to bring you the second lecture in our mini series, all about dark matter. And today's talk is gonna focus on dark matter particles. So these are candidates for this mysterious dark matter that are a lot heavier than the wave-like dark matter that Maria was telling us about last month. Now, if you missed that, or any of our other KIPAC public lectures, you can find them all over on our YouTube channel. Now, searching for dark matter particles has been a lively area of research here at Stanford and just up the road at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. And this research requires not just a detailed study of astrophysics, but also of particle physics, careful design of scientific instrumentation, and careful analysis of the data that comes out. It's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Yella Albers. Yella is an expert on searching for particle-like dark matter and is a postdoctoral fellow here at KIPAC and Stanford, where he searches for dark matter using an experiment called Lux Zeppelin as well as detecting and developing the statistical and machine learning analysis techniques that are needed to do this really careful experiment. Yeller received his PhD in astroparticle physics from the University of Amsterdam, and then went on to be a postdoctoral researcher at the Stockholm University before moving here to Stanford. And at both institutions, he was working on an experiment called Xenon One Ton, an earlier dark matter experiment. Now, before his PhD, Yella studied in Utrecht in the Netherlands and Cambridge in the UK, and was a high school physics teacher in the Netherlands. And this fall, he'll be going back to the Netherlands where he's going to the University of Groningen to start as an assistant professor. So unfortunately, we're uh, sad to see Yella go later in the year. Now, before we get started tonight, I'd like to give a big shout out to the entire team who work hard behind the scenes to bring this event to you. We've got our audio and video team here in the room, making sure you can all see us online, and also our chat moderators who I'd like to invite to introduce us themselves. We have Anne. Hi everyone, I'm Anne. Uh, I'm also a postdoctoral fellow uh, working with Yella on the Lock Cephalon experiment. Um, and I spent some time researching ways that we can improve detector technologies as well. Uh, and in my non-physics time, I like to entertain my two cats, one of which is running around. So sorry if you hear him now. And uh, also, I like to run around the parks here. Thank you, Anne. And we have Zoe. Hi, all. I am a second year PhD student uh, here at Stanford and SLAC, and I work on direct matter detection uh, experiments and making new versions of those for dark matter. So, and we have Jamie. Uh, hi, I'm uh, also a postdoc at Slack, working with Noah Kerensky um, on the super cryogenic dark matter search, which is another dark matter search. Awesome. Now, for those of you who are joining us online tonight, our chat moderators are going to be on hand for the entire lecture to answer any questions that you have during the talk. So feel free to drop those in the chat. And they might even hold over some of your questions for us to put to Yella in person in the room at the end. Now, we welcome all kinds of questions and discussion amongst you online, but we kindly ask that you be respectful of everyone else. And for those of you here with us in person in the room, please save your questions for the end where we'll give Yella a good grilling after the talk. Well, let's welcome Yella to start his lecture. Okay. All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, 
I was told today that uh, 666 people registered for this talk on uh, on dark matter, which is, uh, is very appropriate because uh, our universe really is a thin curtain of light that shrouds a mountain of darkness. And more accurately, between the stars and galaxies that we see at night, a colossal cosmic web is spun of filaments and pillars shaped from a mysterious substance that we call dark matter. So tonight, we will be exploring the efforts that scientists at Kaipak and elsewhere are making to demystify what this substance is, to find out its nature and to catch it in language that is perhaps less poetic, but more scientific. Concretely, we're going to be exploring the hypothesis that dark matter is made of particles. So uh, I and many of my uh, colleagues believe that dark matter is a new form of particle that we have not yet discovered. Uh, so in this first part, I'll tell you a little bit about what dark matter is and uh, why we might think that it is a new particle. And then in the second part, we're going to roll up our sleeves and actually look and try to find what this dark matter is. All right, so let's get started. What is dark matter? So what dark matter is, is already in the words. They were appropriately chosen. Uh, so it is a kind of matter. So it is a substance. It is some kind of stuff. It has a mass. And it can be more in some places than in others. It's not some kind of you know homogeneous thing that's everywhere. It is, it is really some kind of stuff. And it feels and it exerts gravity. That's perhaps its key, its key property, why we know of its existence. So it exerts gravity like anything else in the universe, just like you or I or the planets and the stars. However, it is also dark. What that means is that it cannot emit or absorb light. So we should have really called it transparent matter, but dark matter sounds a lot cooler. So that's what we, we, we went for. Uh, it also is a kind of ghostly matter that passes through regular matter unhindered, right? If uh, a bit of dark matter would encounter a bit of normal matter, it would just pass right through it like a ghost. And finally, it doesn't even show significant interactions with itself beyond, of course, the gravity that it exerts. So it doesn't appear to be in specific clumps or like stars and little dark matter solar systems. For all of these properties, I should add a little caveat. That is only true as far as we can detect. Maybe, maybe dark matter emits a little bit of light. That would be amazing because then we can use that to detect it. Or maybe it does have some slight self interactions or can collide into matter. More on that later. So where would we find dark matter today? Dark matter exists in halos around galaxies. Every galaxy in the sky that you can see, or almost every galaxy, has a very large dark matter halo around it. If you had uh, superpower glasses that you could put on and look at the sky, you would see perhaps something like this, where you can see the different filaments and halos uh, uh, of this, this, this dark matter around us. Uh, and you might wonder where in this picture is our own galaxy. I only showed you the dark matter. That's what our galaxy is. So we are just a tiny, a tiny thing in this much larger web of dark matter. You might say that we are some kind of spider in a cosmic web, or perhaps, of course, we are the fly. Here's a somewhat larger view from a different simulation. So here you see on, on a larger scale, what you know, the, the, how the different different filaments of this cosmic web uh, look. And if you have more questions about that, you can just ask Phil here in the front row who partly ran this, this simulation. So you really see here that you, you get this, this tiny bit of matter in this vast web of dark matter. That's in our computer simulations, but dark matter doesn't just live in our computer simulations. If you look on a very large scale at all the galaxies in the universe with a large cosmological survey, you see the galaxies. Every point in this picture is a galaxy. You see all the galaxies tracing out the filaments of such a cosmic web. And the backbone of this cosmic web is dark matter. Now, if you look at the total amount of matter that exists in the universe, you can divide it in a couple of groups. So at maybe the very top here, 1% of the matter is stars, planets, everything that you see around you. So you can congratulate yourself, at least for tonight, we are all the 1%. <laughs> Below that is more matter, 
uh, mostly it's like thin ionized hydrogen uh, between galaxies. There's a couple other things in there and astronomers work in trying to categorize it out. However, there's a much larger component over here, right? That's this mountain of darkness I was talking about. That is dark matter. So this is 84% of the mass of the matter in the universe. And notice I say mass of the matter because uh, sometimes people talk about energy. And in that case, you have to even include something called dark energy, a kind of energy of empty space. But that is fundamentally different from dark matter, which is really a kind of stuff which can be here and not there, whereas dark energy sort of suffuses the entire universe. And there's a, a fairly simple model for how that affects the universe, whereas dark matter has all kinds of interesting, interesting structures. So we, we'd really like to know what this, what this dark matter is. So why do we believe it? Why do we believe that this kind of dark matter is new particles or it exists at all? There are many types of dark uh, of evidence for dark matter. Maria discussed some of them in her lecture, and you will see more in the later dark matter lectures. Let me just highlight one for you. If you get into a spaceship, and you launch from the Earth, and you look up at the sky, you're going to see something like this. This is the view from the, the Gaia satellite at the Earth's sun, the Lagrange point two. So you see a beautiful view of our galaxy, lots of little stars. You also see a few other galaxies that are a bit of our, our neighbors. But the, the universe you see clearly has some structure, right? There's a galaxy, and here are some other galaxies. And that's true at a little bit larger scales, too. This is a picture from the Hubble, the ultra deep field, where you see that at a large scale, the universe is a huge cloud of many galaxies. But it is a very chunky cloud. It is not just some kind of ooze or that of matter that is you know, somewhat distributed around it. It's clustered. There's little knots in it, these galaxies. But it didn't start that way. If you, you're in your spaceship, also had a lever that activated the time machine and you went back to 300,000 years after the Big Bang, you will see this from your window. Right, so this is, this is the true color of what we now call the cosmic microwave background. So it is, it is redshifted to the, this is the light, the afterglow from the Big Bang, redshifted to the microwave due to the expansion of the universe. So it's the wavelengths have been stretched. But in the early universe, it looked something like this. And notice it's very, it's very much like this ooze that I was talking about. It is just some kind of soup. There are no little clusters in here, or at least there aren't any that I can see, right? Perhaps your eyes are better than mine. Um, we can fix that though. Let me, let me try to enhance this, this color skill a little bit by a factor of thousands. Now I think you can see the little bit of structure that existed in the early universe, right? So you can see this very small pattern, what we call the anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background. Beautiful physics hidden in this, uh, deserves its entire lecture series. So I'm not going to talk too much about it tonight. I just wanted to emphasize that this is very smooth. So it leaves a big question. How did we get from here to there, right? How did this universe that started out so homogeneously started to collapse and form all these different galaxies? Well, it turns out if you don't have dark matter, it doesn't. If you only have regular matter, then in the early universe, it can't collapse. Right? What happens if you try to collapse some matter under gravity and it's very hot, it's going to push back, right? Because matter interacts with itself. So it cannot form stars and galaxies, etc., until the universe has cooled down. But the universe is expanding. You need to collapse quickly in order to form these structures. So what needs to happen is that there already at this point, there are seeds of structure. There are little collapsed knots and things of dark matter hidden in this cosmic microwave background. Dark matter forms the seeds of galaxy formation. Without dark matter, the night sky will be dark and there will be no one to see it. So why do we believe dark matter exists? Because we are here. We can also make this argument, of course, more quantitative. And you can look at the different kinds of structure that exist in the universe. So this is a plot where we look at regions of different size or, or mass scale in the universe. And we find out how, how much structure is there at this scale. And at the very uh, small scales of galaxies, there's lots of different structure. And at large scales, there is much less structure. And the universe looks more homogeneous. And this fits beautifully a model that we get from our uh, computer simulations uh, that included uh, dark matter that I showed you at, uh, at the beginning. There are many more types of uh, evidence for dark matter. Uh, but I think the best evidence comes from cosmology, right? That uh, dark matter seeds the growth of structures from uh, that eventually form, form galaxies. We would not be here without it. And also, it, you can 
precisely match this little pattern in the cosmic microwave background that I saw that you that you saw only if you have a theory of, of dark matter. So from that we know that a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, dark matter was already there and it was already dark, meaning that uh, it made up most of the matter. We can see that from the microwave background and from our predictions of structure formation. And it was already dark. It didn't push back against gravity. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't be dark matter. But almost every large astrophysical system contains today the imprints of dark matter. And that is how dark matter was actually first postulated by people looking at how galaxies rotate, how clusters of galaxies uh, move around each other, the sort of the churning motion of the galaxies. You can look at gravitational lensing, so light being bent by gravity, and most gravity in our universe is exerted by dark matter. So without dark matter, you essentially cannot make sense of any large astrophysical system, large meaning size of a galaxy or beyond. So that's why we believe that dark matter exists. So what could it be? Well, let's make a list of the options. Uh, it could be unusual particles, right? So you might think of, uh, you might have heard some particles called neutrinos that are emitted in, uh, in beta decay of, of uh, atoms, among other things. Uh, but those are already ruled out. Uh, if dark matter is made of neutrinos, basically the universe would not look the way it does today. Neutrinos move far too fast to make the kinds of structures that we see. It could be made of new undiscovered particles. And I think that it is. And many of my colleagues think so as well, because we've got tons of different options motivated by various different particle physics theories. But of course, those are not the only options. It could also be perhaps some dark compact objects, right? If it's made of, of little things uh, that you know only interact when they're very close to each other, like, like planets, for example, or neutron stars, that would also look somewhat like dark matter. But remember, early in the universe, it had to already be there and already be dark. So uh, neutron stars, uh, rogue planets, all these kind of things, it can't be dark matter because they didn't exist yet in the early universe when no stars had yet formed. Similarly, black holes from former stars won't work. If you want black holes, though, you need to form them somehow in the early universe. And that is also a possible model for dark matter. It is uh, not an easy model. And there are many constraints on that. It turns out that black holes change the cosmic microwave backgrounds, or they can be detected through other observations in the universe. But this is a possible model for, for dark matter as well. So I'm going to be talking about this option, that dark matter is made of new and discovered particles. Okay. Great. So that's the hypothesis. Let's try to test it, right? We're scientists. Let's try to detect this particle dark matter. So then we got to first talk a little bit about what kinds of particles we are talking about. And the most important property of a particle is its mass. So here's a rough map of all the different kinds of ideas uh, that people have had about the mass of dark matter. And this, this spans a huge range of masses. Uh, we, the, the, the unit we use for that is electron volts. It's a unit of energy, but Einstein told us mass and energy are equivalent. And so this is 50 orders of magnitude in mass. That's a, that's a huge amount going all the way from here uh, ultralight or wave-like dark matter, uh, which you heard about uh, uh, in our previous lecture, like axions, to over here, wimpish particles. So WIMP stands for weakly interacting massive particle. Uh, that term is often used in physics. I mean, anything could be weakly interacting and uh, massive, uh, but it usually refers specifically to this kind of uh, particle. And uh, specifically in this, this range, or roughly the mass of a proton or a Higgs boson, or maybe something slightly larger. Uh, above that, you have the ultra heavy wimp uh, particles, which have been called the wimp zillas. And then, you know, they're not wimps, but they're, they're bigger and scarier. And then at the very high end, where you get to this, this number, which is roughly something called the, the Planck mass. And that's basically where our, our concept of what a particle is stops making sense. So you have to uh, start thinking about, about clumps of particles or at the very high mass range, of course, the, the black holes. Uh, but there's good reasons to suspect that it's somewhere here. For one thing, all the other particles we know and that have a measured non-zero mass are here, right? The electrons, the lightest, uh, the Higgs is one of the heavier ones. Uh, neutrinos, okay, they have a lower mass. Uh, we don't know exactly how low it is. Maybe it's over here, but it is a reasonable hypothesis, right? That it's somewhat of a similar mass. And in fact, there are stronger arguments to argue why it might be in this mass range. And that has to do with the, how dark matter is produced. 
Uh, I will not go into the detailed models of that here, but basically in the early universe, uh, if you had some kind of equilibrium between ordinary particles and dark matter particles, and it was very hot, particles could convert uh, into each other. Uh, if that's your model of dark matter, well, then there's a lot of constraints you have to work with from all of the different observations that, that, I'll, that I'll mention. And the only window that's sort of left open to you is here. So if that is your model of dark matter, then you really need to look in this range. But even if that's not your model, that's fine. There's still good reasons to just search for these kind of particles in this mass range. And that'll be important for the detectors that we're gonna build and design. So how are we going to detect these, these kind of particles? Right, so okay, suppose it is somewhere here, some, something like the particles that we know, uh, how, do, how do you find it? There's roughly four different ways you could go about it. You could look in the laboratory, or you could look in the cosmos, and you could do so at high energy or low energy. And what I mean by that is that at high energy, dark matter particles can be created or destroyed themselves. So if you have high, uh, high enough energy, you can make or destroy these particles. You can make them in uh, particle colliders, like the Large Hadron Collider in, in Geneva. Uh, you can try to make them at least. Uh, you will not see them because they're dark, but you will see something missing. You will see all the particles going out one way and something is missing. Something that should have come out the other way. You can look in the cosmos. So what you look there uh, for is signals of dark matter being destroyed. So dark particles, there may also be dark antiparticles. If they find each other, they might convert into ordinary particles that we can see, or perhaps we can at least see the heat of those particles. So that is something that uh, in July, uh, Rebecca Lean will get a public lecture about. And I highly recommend you, 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 see, you, you see that. She does many cool research like Talking about these these brown dwarf stars, which are too uh, too cold to sustain fusion, but maybe they're heated by dark matter, and then we could find it that way. I'm more of a low energy person, right? So I I work on uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, scattering experiment. So that's dark matter bumping into ordinary matter and seeing the recoil of that. Uh, and when you're talking about very light dark matter particles, then it's not really a bumping into it. It's more that when these particles are very light, they behave like waves and their, their wavelength becomes very long. So it's more like getting in tune with this wave of dark matter, doing a kind of resonance experiment. And that is what Maria talked about in her lecture. So she worked on the experiment called PM radio. This is LZ, by the way. We'll hear a lot more about that. Finally, you can look at gravitational probes. Uh, I mentioned that dark matter seeds the structure in a universe. You can see what structure there is in our universe and then constrain maybe what kind of interactions the dark matter has or how quickly it's moving. And that can also constrain what dark matter is. So today I'm gonna to talk mostly about uh, scattering of uh, dark matter, trying to detect it that way. Uh, I also work a little on, on gravitational probes. So if you're interested in that, ask me after the lecture and we can talk about that. So how does this work? Do we all just do our little search and when we don't find it, we're sad and then nothing happens? No, what happens is that we are closing in on the parameter space of dark matter. Imagine uh, a, a, this, this slide is a space where all the dark matter models live. So maybe a theorist thinks it's here, another thinks it's here. Maybe you think it's over there. Uh, and what we're doing is with our experiments, slowly carving out some regions of parameter space. If it's over here, no, nope, we would have seen it in colliders. Here, we would have seen it uh, in a scattering experiment. We would have seen it bumping into ordinary matter. Here, the universe would have different kinds of galaxies and halos. The model without dark matter, by the way, where there's no dark matter, that's way over here. That's long occluded. And if it's over here, we would have seen annihilation signals. So as we pro make progress, we are slowly closing in on what dark matter models remain. Right, let's talk a little about scattering. So what, what do we mean by scattering? Like, what does it mean when the dark matter bumps into another particle? There are many ways to do that. I'm just going to talk about basically one way to do that, where the dark matter particle just you know, bumps into, into the nucleus, so and that nucleus will then get a little bit of a kick that you could try to, to measure. Uh, that's the most common, and it is uh, uh, you know, what we usually measure. It is a little hard to detect for light dark matter. And you can imagine why, right? Imagine that this dark matter particle here is very light, uh, so then it hits maybe a large nucleus, it's like throwing ping pong balls at the freight train, right? It's not gonna move, right? So that, that this does not work for very light dark matter. Uh, you might try uh, the, the center model uh, where you're scattering off electrons instead. For many models that turns out to be a little rare, 
uh, but you could look for it for light dark matter. And there's even a funny effect called the Migdal effect, where the dark matter bumps into the nucleus, nucleus gets a kick, and one of the electrons get less be left behind. So now you've got an atom uh, uh, roaming around that's missing an electron. So it's an ion that's moving around. And that ion might, uh, might relax or might obtain electrons from elsewhere that gets you a different energy. Uh, and you know that, that can maybe make some models more accessible than in the, uh, the simple case. But for today, I'm just going to focus on simply bumping into a nucleus. Okay. Right, so we're, we're going to look for dark matter bumping into the nucleus. Uh, and we want to build a detector to see that. So we got to do three things. The detector has to make dark matter scatters visible. Clearly, right? Otherwise, it's not a detector. I also want to see many of these dark matter scatters. Uh, right? I want to have a good chance of seeing them. And I don't want to see anything else. So I'll slowly walk you through these three uh, requirements and how the experiment that I work on, Luke Zeppelin, and other experiments satisfy them. First, make dark matter scatters visible. So what I want to see is that after dark matter has bumped into a nucleus, some detectable signal comes out. So I want to transmit uh, a light. Uh, perhaps photons come off of this, right? So the, the nucleus is moving through the matter and that's you know, maybe exciting or ionizing some things. There could be some light from that. So the light has got to be transmitted. Um, it could detect charge, right? Maybe it liberates some electrons on its path as it's moving around this nucleus, or the heat, right? Maybe uh, all I can detect is just the, the residual heat that my, my detector heats up a little bit. These are the three channels that you could, could study. So uh, on the left, you can see the Lux Zeppelin experiment. We detect light and charge. And on the right, you see a component of the super CDMS experiment, and they detect heat and charge. And so there's different uh, strategies of uh, doing that. So let's talk about the Lux Zeppelin experiment, how it, uh, how it works. So here you see what's happening. So you've got a, a dark matter particle over there. Uh, it hits a little xenon atom. And what that's going to do is, as it's moving through the other uh, xenon atoms, it's going to maybe liberate some electrons and uh, ionize and excite some xenon atoms, which will uh, de-excite back. There's some interesting chemistry there. It turns out that it forms a xenon-2 molecule for a little while. And then that xenon-2 molecule disintegrates, emitting a photon that then ordinary xenon atoms cannot absorb. So that's just a, a funny bit of chemistry that happens. But that's the reason that we can see this, this light coming off the, uh, of this, this scatter. So we've got sensitive light sensors on the bottom and the top that are meant to, uh, to detect this light. So also there's some uh, electrons liberated, right? Uh, those electrons we drift up, so we apply an electric field over this, this detector. So there's a positive uh, uh, basic charge over here, an anode and a cathode uh, over there. So the electrons drift up until they get to a layer of gaseous xenon. Then there's far less xenon atoms to bump into. So there's a big electric field there. What's going to happen is they're going to get accelerated. So they bump into more xenon atoms, they excite more of them, and a big light flash ensues. So if dark matter bumps into our xenon atom, we see two things. First, we see a flash of light. We call it S1, because it's the first signal. Then the electrons are drifting up. We see nothing for a while. We just wait. And then there's a big second flash, the S2. So with the information, I can reconstruct how deep in my detector the event was. Right? If I need to wait a long time, apparently those electrons needed a long time to drift up. And it was very deep in the detector. I can also reconstruct where in the x, y, in, the, in the, the horizontal plane it happened, because this light flash, this S2, is so big that I'm going to see it more in some light centers than in others. So with those two pieces, I can reconstruct where in the detector it happened. You might say that's great, but what uses that? Hang on, it's going to be crucial. Without this, the experiment would not work. So that's schematically how Lux Zeppelin works. Uh, so this is here's some pictures of uh, how the detector looks. So this is the, the central piece of the detector. We call it the time projection chamber. Looks right out of a science fiction movie. It's just uh, uh, basically the, refers to that you, that you count the time until the electrons uh, drift up. Uh, if you looked inside, you would see this, this, this beautiful, uh, I guess it's a compound eye, and we're just continuing this, this fly metaphor. Uh, of, of light sensors, each of them sensitive enough to a single photon. Uh, they're called photomultipliers, these sensors. And uh, there's also 
uh, little uh, grids of, of, of wires. And they were woven here at, at Slack, some of my, my Slack colleagues over here using a custom loom that was really built for this purpose. So they were woven. Okay. So you can do other experiments that work very similarly. And you've got super CDMS here very schematically. So there's also a cylinder, but it's made of uh, germanium or uh, silicon. So it's a semiconductor. So when dark matter hits that, then uh, electrons are liberated and you get little, little holes in a semiconductor. And with an electric field, you can again drift those charges up. Uh, you can't really see light in the middle of a germanium crystal, but you can see heat. Uh, so what, what, what super CDMS folks do is they cool this whole thing down to like millikelvin temperature. So extremely cold, only just above absolute zero. And then they use a superconducting center that's right at the edge of not being a superconductor anymore. If you heat it up a little bit more, it stops being a superconductor. And then this tiny bit of heat from a single dark matter scatter becomes detectable in their detector. Okay. Right, so those are just so some ways you could build uh, dark matter detectors to make the scatters visible. But that's only part of the problem. I also want to see a lot of dark matter scatters, and I don't want to see other things. So seeing a lot, there's an easy solution to that, right? You make it big. You have a really big detector, then there's a bigger chance if a dark matter particle comes along that it will actually hit your detector. So as we progress in these experiments, we make them larger and larger. It also really helps to make a very large nucleus. There's a quantum mechanical effect where a dark matter particle isn't scattering off a single proton or electron, but is really scattering off all the protons and electrons at once. And that sort of interferes and gives you a boost. So that's a reason to use a big nucleus like xenon. Uh, except when you're searching for this very light dark matter, of course, right? Remember the ping pong ball on the freight train? If you have a light dark matter, you don't want the big nucleus. That's why one of the reasons super CDMS also has silicon detectors. But the real thing that defines our field is the third requirement. All these things can be realized relatively simply, right? They, they could have been realized at least a long time ago. The real challenge is seeing nothing else. If you just build a detector and place it down over here, it would see all sorts of signals, mainly from radioactivity and, and cosmic rays. So that is our real challenge. So uh, let's see how the detectors have progressed uh, through this. So here you see for liquid xenon detectors, sort of our march of, of progress. So here you see our sensitive mass. We started with xenon 10, that was uh, like you know, 15 years ago, 2007. Uh, that's just five kilograms. We scaled it up, xenon 100, then you got Lux, Panda X2 in, in, in China, Lux is in the US, xenon 1 ton in Italy again. And now there's actually three of these detectors running, each with a mass of four to seven tons, way larger than xenon 10. But we didn't just make a bigger bucket. We also had to make things cleaner. So looking at the background, you see the background shrinking from 5.3 events uh, in some units per ton kV per day uh, down to all the way like 0 0.05, right? So this, this represents a tremendous progress in, in just a span of 15 years. So let's dig into this, this background. How do you make an event in, in Lux Zeppelin? How do you get these kind of you know, S1, S2 events other than, than dark matter? Basically, there's three ways. First, you could just ignore the fact that we are deep underground, go through the rock anyway, and then scatter in our experiment. That is what uh, muons do. They're particles that are generated by cosmic rays. They can penetrate very deep into the rock. That's actually the reason we go underground, to at least suppress them by, by somewhat. Uh, by, by several orders of magnitude, actually, but occasionally they can still come. Neutrinos don't care about anything. They just pass right through, and occasionally we, we see them in, in our detector, and that will be important at the end. Uh, and of course, dark matter, right? Dark matter does, certainly doesn't care about rocks. It just, you know, goes straight through. So that's why we go uh, to interesting uh, uh, places underground. Uh, so this is in, uh, in uh, Lab South Dakota, where you have a, a mine shaft. And if you go uh, very deep, there's an abandoned uh, gold mine over there. I say abandoned, but it's really maintained, right? They, they keep it dry for us. Uh, but a lot of gold was mined and isn't anymore. And very deep in the ground is a cavern. And there it sits the Lux Zeppelin experiment. Or if you want to go to Europe, you could go to uh, Assergi in Italy a beautiful uh, little uh, little town where there is a physics lab and a highway that goes into the mountain and halfway through the mountain, you can turn left. And then you get to a physics lab where sits the xenon monton experiment, a uh, close cousin, a uh, xenon anton experiment, close cousin to LZ. Second way to make events. You could be somewhere in our lab and you just go through centimeters of metal and water and xenon that we have assembled to shield our detector. 
So there's several things that can do that. Uh, uh, neutrons, right? So there's just some, some radioactivity in the rock and the, the, the neutron, uh, neutrons are very penetrating particles. So they, they, they're neutral. So they might enter our detector, but hopefully they'll be caught in this, this sort of shielding of our detector. Really these detectors are made of onions or they're no, sorry, not made of onions. They're made like onions. So you, you, you got some xenon in the center and then we've got some, some layers around it that are meant to detect these kind of particles like, like neutrons. And the same for external beta and gamma radiation. Right, so here's just some, some pictures showing this outer detector for, for Lux Zeppelin. So the inner detector would go uh, in here to the time protection chamber. And here's the outer detector uh, around it. Uh, there's some, some organic scintillator that goes in here. It's actually a precursor to laundry detergent. Somehow it's a, a good particle uh, detector medium and it's watched by these filter multipliers. And here you just see some, some physicists for, for scale. Okay, so, so how do we do this? Rejecting these, these external backgrounds, how does that work? Well, here you see the, the events that we saw in our first science run of Lux Zeppelin. So here you see the, the radius of our inner detector and here you see this depth. Right, so this is the top of our detector and here is the, is the bottom. And every dot is an event. Now, as you can see, there are way more events at the edge. So those are all those neutrons, gamma rays, beta rays I was talking about. If we didn't have this outer detector, we would have to cut somewhere around here, right? And those will be the, the remaining backgrounds. So you, see, you, would, you would cut away that, that right part. But because we have those outer detectors, we can do a trick. And that is, if those outer detectors see a signal at the same time, probably it wasn't a dark matter particle. Right? Dark matter particles interact very rarely with ordinary matter. So uh, they certainly wouldn't scatter twice, first in our outer detector and then our inner detector, but neutrons might do that. So those are all those red crosses and, uh, and, and blue dots. So those are rejected by those, those veto detectors. So they enable us to look deeper into our, uh, to keep more of our detector. And now you also see why reconstructing where an event happens is important. Because if the event happened over here in this little corner, I don't think it's dark matter. I think it's something else. Did it happen here in the center? Now it might be dark matter. But this, this is still not all of the story, right? You see that even in the center of the detector, there is some background. So the, 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 the nastiest background that we have is that there are some things that invade our xenon. There are, uh, in our pipes and pumps and in metal that's, that, that surrounds us, there is some, some radium, uh, that is a radioactive isotope. It comes from thorium, which in terms come from uranium. There's always a little bit of that contamination in there. I and mean, in the case, it makes radon gas, which you may have heard of since it can accumulate in, in basements as well. And that radon gas enters our xenon because it's a gas and this liquid xenon uh, will take it along with it. It's the single radon atom. It will decay and that decay we might then see as a background. There are other radioactivity, uh, there are some naturally occurring xenon isotopes that are very, very slightly radioactive. Some of them, we actually discovered that they were radioactive. Their half-lives are measured in like 10 to the 20 years, some, something ridiculous, way longer than the age of the universe. So they're not a huge background, but they're there. And you've got other noble gases that are very difficult to separate from the xenon. Uh, and there's some argon isotope that fortunately decays quickly. Uh, and there's a krypton isotope that uh, at Slack people built a, a huge purification plant just to, to get the krypton uh, out of our xenon. So the way you fight that background is more complicated. You can look at the size of our signals. So you can look at the S1 size, that's the first signal, and the S2 size, the second signal, and look at the balance of these two signals. Most of the backgrounds form a band over here. There's this gray band, whereas a dark matter signal will be in this, this purple bands uh, over here. So uh, you can see that the events that we saw, this is from our first science run, they were all consistent with backgrounds. So we did not see dark matter. So that's, that's of course a little, a little sad, but remember we can use this to constrain what dark matter is. So that's what we do uh, in our final results. So our final results always look like this. So you see again, the mass of the dark matter particle here on the x-axis. And here you see something called the interaction strengths. Doesn't matter in what units they are. Just uh, right if you go from here to here, that model makes like a hundred times more events. So we are much more likely to see it. Before LZ, the constraints were on this, this, this green line from other experiments. And LZ, the first results from just a couple months of data is this white line. And in, uh, you know, in a few more years, we hope to be over here. Uh, well, really we hope to discover a dark matter that lives over here. 
uh, but uh, that's where we, we want to end up. So you see that in you know, like 15 years, we cover this huge span of like five orders of magnitude. So, so that's this, this march of progress of experiments that we, that we saw. So the way to read this plot is that uh, anything above here, right, with a large interaction strength, those models are ruled out. Right, they would have been seen. They would have produced hundreds of thousands of events, these guys, and uh, maybe these guys a thousand, a hundred, and less and less. Here you get two models that used to be possible, but LZ ruled out. At least they're very bad news for those models. It's, it's strange why LZ didn't see anything if you expect like five events or something. But here, the dark matter could still, could still be hiding. Now you notice this purple thing. There is an end to this uh, technology, or at least this, uh, the, the, the pace of our progress is going to slow because eventually we will start detecting a neutrino background. So there are neutrinos in our, in our universe from the sun and also generated by cosmic rays in the atmosphere. And uh, eventually we will start uh, detecting some process of them. Of course, neutrinos have been detected long ago, but this is true a particular process that really mimics dark matter. So that's why it will be our ultimate background we call the neutrino fog. So our future, sort of ultimate liquid xenon experiment over here, which might take you know, a decade to build, will only cover this, this, this slight range. But it will be a very interesting observatory because it will measure also those neutrinos. Okay, so uh, what's, what does this all mean for dark matter? Well, LZ sets mostly constraints over here, right? Remember this mass range plot that we saw at the beginning? So, so those models are really uh, constrained by, uh, by LZ and other experiments. Uh, but this is, of course, not the, not the full picture. There are, there are more dark matter uh, models. Uh, there are experiments targeting these kind of models. These models are a little harder to see from Earth. Basically, what happens if you've got a very heavy dark matter particle, there are not that many of them. Because we know how much dark matter there is. There is either lots of light particles or a few really heavy particles. And if it's a few really heavy particles, we've got to wait a long time before one of them shows up. So that, that, that's tricky. You might want to test that with some other probe, but we do have some constraints on them uh, from, our, uh, from our detector. And there's other models over here, the ultralight uh, dark matter, and uh, of course there's, there's models over there. Uh, so, so really what, what we're trying to do is you know, closing in on what the dark matter particle might be. So Lux Zeppelin uh, and other experiments are making this bound tighter and tighter by trying to see uh, dark matter scattering in a, in a better and better way. And at the same time, people are working on uh, colliders, uh, on signals of dark matter being destroyed, and on trying to look more closely at galaxies and halos in, uh, in the universe. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. We have not found dark matter yet, but as I say, we are, we are, we are slowly closing in. And hopefully at some point we, we will have a, a discovery for you, or at least uh, learned more about what dark matter is and is not. So in summary, um, what is dark matter? Dark matter is a substance. It's, it's a real thing with mass. Uh, it, it, it's more in some places than in others, but it interacts through gravity, just like, like other uh, particles in the universe, and it outweighs matter uh, five to one. Why do we believe it exists? Well, because uh, it is necessary to form galaxies in time, given our, our very uh, you know, homogeneous, soupy early universe. And also, its signatures are all over every large astrophysical system. So how can we detect it and, and nail down its nature more precisely? Uh, well, you can search in the sky, uh, or you can look in experiments on Earth. And the main requirement that you have to satisfy there is that you see little else. You don't see any of this radioactivity or cosmic rays. In other words, if you want to find dark matter, you need to go where all other lights turn out. Wow, that was a very informative talk, Yella, and just thank you very much for, uh, you know, talking to this full house of uh, audience without uh, your mic actually being on. So, you oh, know, okay. that, must, <laughs> that must have taken a lot of, uh, uh, of your voice. So drink enough water and uh, we will start our Q&A session right now. So any questions right here? I'm not a physicist, but um, I'm very interested in, you put up a reference video. I think you wrote on it one time. Yes. Yeah. It's the other one. I think there was a collective uh, Jump for Joy a few years back. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. That was observed. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if this is truly a particle, how do you um, 
proposed? Do you have any ideas about how it would change the standard model? Uh, would it add to it? Would it? Uh, what, what kind of yeah. changes would you? Expect? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. Would you mind also repeating the question? Yeah. So so uh, I was asked basically. Uh, what consequences would the discovery of a dark matter particle have for the standard model? Where would it fit? What would it mean for all the other particles that, that exist? Uh, and that's an excellent question. And it really depends on, on what kind of dark matter particle there is. There are dark proposed dark matter uh, particles that would fit very nicely into the standard model. Uh, you're talking maybe about something called a sterile neutrino, basically a, a shy cousin of the regular neutrino that doesn't interact as much with matter. Uh, another proposal is something called supersymmetry, that every dark matter, every particle in the standard model has a partner. And if the ordinary particle was a, a, a boson, like the Higgs boson, uh, the, the partner would be a fermion. Um, and those might be heavier. And the lightest one of those, those, those super partners might be the dark matter particle uh, that you see. Uh, there's a proposal called axions, which you heard about in, in, in our last lecture, that would solve uh, a problem in this, or in, uh, something strange in the standard model where you might think that the neutron has a large uh, you know, response to, to, uh, to, to electric uh, fields, so electric dipole moments. Uh, so there are various dark matter particles that would you know, solve problems within the standard model, but it might also make things much more complicated, right? Who knows what it's going to be? Maybe it's just some random other particle that will force theorists to come up with a completely new, new theory. So we'll have to see which one it is. Mm -hmm. Question over there. When you talked a little bit about like the probability of detecting an event. So like the known ones that you know roughly how much dark matter there is. And if it's like big, there's not gonna be as much of it. How do you know that the dark, how do you like publicly get at that if the dark matter is not equally distributed? Like what if it's all in a halo somewhere and we're not getting anywhere from the earth? Yeah, so, so the question is, hey, I made these arguments saying that uh, you know, there's a certain amount of dark matter, maybe it's more if it's light and less if it's heavy, so there's a certain number of particles, but how do we know what the amount of dark matter here is in our, in our galaxy? Uh, yeah, that, that is a thing, an, an uncertainty of our, of our experiments, but we do have information about it, right? What we, we, we know is in, in our own galaxy, we can measure how stars far away at the, at the edges of our galaxy rotate, and uh, through that, figure out how much of a pool they are getting from the center. So how much mass must there be sort of, uh, of, of dark matter and other things in the, in the galaxy? So that's one constraint. But then you might still say, yeah, but that, that is a very coarse resolution of your measurement. Now you're just knowing how much dark matter there is in the galaxy. And maybe this dark matter has a kind of self-interaction or something that causes it to, to clump up in, in lots of little, uh, little scales. And uh, yeah, then, then we wouldn't see anything. Uh, but that requires a very, very specific dark matter model. Uh, and most dark matter models uh, have a, you know, a, a pretty uh, a nice, uh, relatively smooth distribution in the center of the galaxy. There are occasionally uh, little excesses, though. Right? Maybe you get a little bit of a, a sort of a, a core of a, of, a, of a little galaxy that we, eat, we, we ate up as our Milky Way uh, that still has you know, some, some, some presence of dark matter remaining. So there could be a little bit of an, an excess of dark matter. And that would be great because then we see a little bit more. Uh, but as being in a dark matter void requires a very specific dark matter model. Great. Um, so we'll take that later. Actually, there is a very classic uh, question from online. And I know every time we talk about dark matter, people, you know, would always think about, oh, what if that is not the the only answer, right? Mm -hmm. So actually, there is uh, one question from uh, Professor D asking, is uh, MOND, the modified Newtonian dynamics, um, already ruled out as a possible alternative, given what you have presented? Already? Yeah, so, so modified Newtonian dynamics is an idea from many decades ago. And when people uh, certainly knew about these, these effects of like the rotations of galaxies that, that stars seem to rotate faster than they did. So there seemed to be some extra mass in galaxies. And the alternative theory to that was, well, maybe there isn't this extra mass. Gravity just works a little bit different, right? At very large scales, we just, we just need to like, like tweak the laws of, uh, of Einstein a little bit. And that can also fit the data. And that, that, that works for, for, for most uh, galaxies. When you get to like clusters of galaxies, it starts becoming a little bit more difficult. You still need some dark matter and you need to like, like tune it more specifically. And when you get to cosmology, this is just a disaster, right? There, you, you basically cannot predict the, uh, the structure formation argument that I gave, right? That you, 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 you form uh, 
that galaxies around seeds of, of something that is dark matter. Like, how are you going to tune your law of gravity to really mimic a dark matter particle? You could do it, right? If you write down enough terms in your equation, eventually you'll get something that really looks and behaves like a dark matter particle. And then I invoke the duck principle, right? If it walks, talks, and quacks, et cetera, you, you, you know the deal. So uh, yes, it was a very popular model back then. There are still people thinking about ways of modifying the laws of physics. Happy to let them keep doing that. Uh, but the simplest and uh, best way uh, to explain all of the data sort of in, in one fell swoop is just the introduction of a dark matter particle. And then there are many options for what that particle could be. And ultimately, that's just something we, we need to test. Right? Only when the dark matter particle has really been found can we truly say that those options are ruled out, but they are very much constrained. I love your answer. Thank you. <laughs> and it's always a tough question to answer. Mm -hmm. um, any questions over there? A question about the role of dark matter to see the matter. Um, you mentioned that it sees the galaxies. What about star system? What about, what about planets? Does it see our planet as well? Right, so, so the question is, hey, so does this dark matter seize the galaxies through its gravity, right? It is, is it affected by the gravity of all other things? That means it must be affected by gravities of stars and planets as well. Absolutely. So uh, in, in fact, you, you might think that stars and planets start collecting a little bit of dark matter, right? Maybe it will eventually, you know, spiral into the, the core and then form a little bit of extra dark matter. The, the tricky bit with that is, uh, if you've got a dark matter particle coming in with a lot of speed and it, okay, it passes by the earth, okay, maybe it is deflected by the gravity of the earth, but how do you get it to accumulate in the center? You need to slow it down. So, so somehow the dark matter, in order for it to collect in stars and in, in, in planets, must be slowed down. And gravity turns out can do it a little bit, but it's not, not enough. So you need to have a kind of, uh, you need to let it scatter a lot in ordinary matter in order for it to slow it down and have it collect in the cores. But if you do that, you might be able to see the dark matter, giving some kind of signature of, for example, heating up the core of a planet. If you're interested in that, come to Rebecca Lean's lecture in July, because she's going to talk all about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was just about to say that. Thanks for the plug. Um, right here. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering about the neutrino fog. Is it likely that there are dark matter particles that are there? And if so, how do we detect them? Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, hey, you showed this neutrino fog. Uh, could the dark matter be hiding below that? Uh, unfortunately, yes, it could be. Uh, as to how likely it is, that's very difficult. It depends on which theorist you ask. Like, what, what is their idea of what dark matter might be? There are definitely a lot of models that are not below the neutrino fog, but also a few models that are. How do you detect it? Well, one way is to do all of the other probes. Right? Try to find it in a collider, try to find its signatures in the universe, or try to probe it gravitationally. That's one way. You can also try to detect to build a new kind of detector that is sensitive to the direction where these particles are coming from. Because uh, those neutrinos, they are coming primarily from the sun and from the atmosphere. And the dark matter is actually uh, mostly coming from one specific direction. Uh, there's sort of a wind of dark matter because the, the, the sun is rotating around the galaxy. So we're, we're seeing a kind of headwind of dark matter. So we know where the dark matter particles ought to be coming from. So if you have a detector sensitive to where particles are coming from, you can cut out those neutrinos, focus on the dark matter, and still detect those dark matter models below the neutrino floor. And people are actively working on making those detectors happen. And actually, speaking of different possibilities, we have another online question from Rebecca asking, when scientists do all these kind of experiments that you just described, um, do you actually consider that dark matter can do things that we just haven't detected yet, or say it behaves in a totally different way to particle physics as we understand it? Yeah, yeah, that's that's an interesting one. So certainly, dark matter should be doing some things we haven't detected yet for us to detect it. Uh, at least we hope so, right? So if dark matter doesn't bump off ordinary particles at all, then you know LZ is not going to detect it. Uh, then the only way we can probe it, if it doesn't interact with in any other way than gravity, is through its, its gravitational interaction. So you can look at like how dark matter is distributed. Uh, as to doing something that's completely outside the realm of what, what particle physics normally does, well, we know it does gravity pretty much the way we think. 
uh, and to a pretty high accuracy because we can do these these simulations of the universe and see uh, things agreeing very well with it or even just simple calculations when you're talking early enough in the universe so yes there's much behavior of dark matter that we don't know and that's why we we are trying to detect it because uh, until you really know what dark matter does how can you say for sure you understand all the other systems in the universe, right? Maybe stars are heated a little bit by dark matter and that could change their evolution. Maybe galaxies, uh, you know, the, there's some, some, some dark matter uh, process happening somewhere in the center that could, that could affect them. Uh, so yeah, partly to answer, we're trying to answer your question with these detectors uh, uh, and uh, yeah, we hope to eventually have an answer for you. Thank you. And I saw there was still a question over there. Is there a detector design that is capable of measuring the gravitational interaction of the dark matter particles? Great, right. So the question is, is there a detector design that can measure the gravitational interaction of a dark matter particle? And you said dark matter particle, right? So you mean one dark matter particle. The answer is there is definitely a design. It is called a wind chime uh, because it's made of a lot of little centers that are in a, in a big 3D grid. And then if a single dark matter passes through that, the sensors would, would slightly vibrate just through its gravity. Uh, and that'll only work if a single dark matter particle is really massive. So uh, you can forget about detecting like the, the, the you know, proton mass size, uh, proton mass particles. But if you're talking like a Planck mass particle, so the mass of like your eyelash hair or, or a grain of pollen, those might be eventually be able to detect, we might be able to detect a, a single particle of those uh, through its gravitational interaction. But those are very much designs because again, the very heavy dark matter particles are very rare because we know how much dark matter there is in total. But yes, people are definitely working uh, on that sort of as a as a last fallback option for, for scattering detectors. Yeah. We'll take one last in-person question over there. Thank you, crazy question. Does relativity have to apply to dark matter? Okay, so the question is, does relativity have to imply the dark matter? Um, so uh, general relativity is, a, is our, our theory of, of gravity invented by Einstein, basically saying that uh, gravity is a result of, of, of space time that, that, that curves. And that is a very accurate description of, of gravity uh, at, uh, at, at different scales. And we're, we're, we're actively testing from the very small and the very large scales, how long that, uh, that applies. So, but general relativity doesn't say so much about what the matter is. There are certain uh, constraints in general relativity that basically say, well, if you got really weird matter, if it has some kind of you know, a speed of sound, for example, that's larger than the speed of light, you're going to see some strange things in your space time, right? You might be starting to see, uh, you know, uh, sort of like time machine curves or, you know, uh, just other weird properties. So those kind of constraints there are from, from, from relativity, but they're still not really constraints. They're just saying, hey, uh, if the matter is weird like this, you're, you're going to see, see weird things. Uh, dark matter is, as far as we know, not weird in, in those aspects. We can completely model it with just an ordinary substance that doesn't interact much to, uh, to other things. So I wouldn't say general relativity implies dark matter. But of course, our knowledge of gravity is what led us to observe the dark matter. So in a sense, um, gravity, of course, led us to the, to the discovery of dark matter, but does not imply it in its, in its theory. Thank you. And we're going to wrap up the Q&A with a very philosophical question uh, from an online audience member from Raya. And below, I am doing direct quotes. Um, um, question from my science buff kids. Why is dark matter a subject of curiosity when physical matter is a sizable chunk to research? Sure. So, so why do we care about dark matter? Isn't this 1% enough? Can we just study, study that and, and you know, be, be, be satisfied? Uh, I assure you that the, that the vast majority of physicists are working on regular matter, right? On the various intricacies of how it interacts and how we build devices. But I think this huge amount of, of dark matter that exists in the universe, without which we wouldn't be here, this vast cosmic web that seems to string the galaxies together, where we are, these galaxies are like little fireflies caught in this cosmic web. Wouldn't it be great to know what that consists of? Wouldn't it be great to know what its implications are for the, for the standard model or for gravity or for the other theories of physics we have? I think it will be. And that's why I study dark matter. I love that. And thank you very much for a great presentation and the Q&A.
So, of course, the Q&A was pretty short, uh, but Yella will be here um, in person if you would like to talk to him afterwards. And if you have more online questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, so before we wrap up the event, um, I also would like to just quickly introduce what's coming up next. Um, so uh, our next lecture, um, as some of the questions that have already touched on in the Q&A, we'll actually be talking about how do we search for dark matter near astrophysical objects. So um, those are actually going to be answering some of the questions like, oh, are there actually dark matter, say, near our sun? on Earth, um, nearby, in the solar system planets, or even in exoplanet systems. So if you want to hear more about that, come um, to our final lecture in the series in about six weeks. Um, so I put in, I put there as uh, mid-July because we're still waiting for the venue confirmation. But uh, I will let everyone know um, as soon as it is confirmed. Most likely, it will still be um, in this room. Um, and that will be given by a staff scientist at, at Slack, um, who's also a KIPAC member, uh, Rebecca Lee. And if you want to uh, follow KIPAC, um, we have all different kinds of social media channels. Um, you could also visit our website uh, for more events and uh, um, educational programs that we're currently offering. And of course, if you want to join our mailing list, you won't miss any single event that we host in the future. So I would like to bring everyone back um, and also uh, say thank you for joining all, all of us uh, for this fantastic lecture given by Yella today and also thank all of our chat moderators for their hard work on YouTube. We will be sending out an email uh, tomorrow uh, providing a few more links and additional information and would of course also love to hear from you regarding how you felt about this lecture and the other topics that you would uh, like to hear from us so that we could design um, our lecture series around your preference and needs. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you everyone for joining us and Yellow's here for more questions. <laughs>